right. <laughs> well, this feels like a healing weekend. Um, last night, uh, many of us saw the film Loving Lionheart about um, a mom and a boy born with half a heart. Is that right? It was half? Yeah. Incredible uh, story. So um, thank you for that film. Uh, we'll see more, no doubt. Yeah. <clears throat> the images on the front of the temple um, are this wonderful sky blue. And um, you won't see that on uh, any traditional temples in Asia. Are you aware of that? Yeah. So we, we know what they represent. They represent um, medicine, Buddha, and healing. So that's the first thing I want people to see when they, they come in. It's funny, I'm so used to coming in now that maybe I don't see them, so I have to look at them. <laughs> you know, it's funny. But that's um, the front. So medicine, Buddha, and healing, um, I'm putting right out from the very beginning. So I'm going to say a few words and some overview, and then uh, our our guest person, who's not really a guest member, so um, but um, I don't think she's given a talk since the beginning of COVID. So here we are. <clears throat> the um, structure of the Dharma path um, sometimes is. Uh, uh, done in a hierarchical way, or first things first. Uh, so sometimes uh, in our tradition, we'd say first there's a Hinayana path, then Mahayana, and then Vajrayana. <clears throat> Hinayana meaning uh, individual liberation, Mahayana meaning uh, incomparable, great uh, vehicle liberation and vajrayana indestructible like that. Uh, um, for the talk today, I'm uh, changing the words a little bit that first we say Hinayana starts with healing. <clears throat> uh, and then maybe Mahayana enlightenment and then vajrayana um, awakening. <clears throat> it's absolutely essential uh, even on conventional level, we start with healing. The Buddha said, please take care of your skandhas, right? Please take care of your body and mind. So a big emphasis uh, on the Sangha here is um, towards health and healing. Practically, it's very difficult to do uh, advanced meditations um, or deep meditations, whatever uh, word you want to use, if we're actively harming ourselves and harming others. So uh, Buddha and all the lineage teachers, including myself, want to say, first, do no harm. Heal first. So uh, get enough rest, you know, uh, get, you know, work with your wounds, and that includes psychological healing. Dharma practice, to see the nature of mind, to see how things actually are, um, is weirdly challenging, because of course it's who we are and it's here all the time. But when we're actively harming ourselves and others, when we're not um, carrying through on behavior based on wanting to benefit others, it's very difficult to see things as they are. It's very difficult to achieve deep samadhi states. We have to start where we are. We have to start where the Buddha started, saying, I'm going to talk about the truth of suffering. I'm going to talk about where we are. So in the Sangha, I'm very happy to say that um, we've... Uh, maybe I, I like to think this is my anecdotal evidence that maybe there's more uh, nurses, therapists, social workers, physicians, uh, percentage-wise than other sanghas. Um, so I'm a little bit biased towards the healing professions, of course. Um, uh, I'm also biased toward artists, of course, and 
uh, we join it all together. But this Sangha, um, particularly, I like to call like uh, chaplaincy Sangha, Bodhisattva Sangha. So the emphasis is on not doing retreat uh, by itself, not doing study by itself, um, but uh, getting out in the community and bringing the community here. Capiche? Yeah. So um, to work with others, uh, to benefit others, um, actually, we have to be uh, pretty healthy ourselves, <laughs> right? Or at least uh, aware of our um, uh, strong countertransference. <laughs> so here's who I can work with, who here's what I can and cannot do, right? Like that. So uh, we put in the Sangha a big emphasis on uh, recovery from addictions, a big emphasis, a hope on, on a healthy lifestyle. <clears throat> uh, um, and that's why I'm, I'm really happy to uh, maybe reintroduce or introduce uh, <coughs> Dr. Julian, uh, who's um, had an interesting journey. Um, and I, I want her to talk about her journey, not just what she's doing now, but how she got to where she is. What she wants to do with it like that. Um, definitely as a um, uh, way of recommendation, uh, uh, Julie knows like if if I need like a complete like uh, if if I ever have a crisis uh, medicine situation, you know, like uh, cut off my finger while I'm trying to cut a tomato. You, you... <laughs> so she would tell me, okay, call this person, right? Like definitely like that. Um, so. Uh, or, uh, you know, something something where you needed uh, like Tara-like immediate response like that, you know? Tara, Green Tara has her leg out, so she's stepping out of meditation to benefit others. I'm very fortunate that, you know, uh, you know I, I live with a nurse who's totally on it too, and if it weren't for that, I probably would not be healthy, right? So even though I have good habits in a way, um, I, I do need to be, you know, like bugged a little bit. Don't you think that's important from time to time? Yeah, bodhisattvas bug people. Like, have you have you done your, you know, have you gotten your labs done? You know, it's like <laughs> something like that. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I'm biased towards uh, reaching out and benefiting others. Uh, but to benefit others, we, we also have to take care of ourselves dramatically like that. So um, my teacher used to bug me a lot, you know, which was uh, really helpful. Um, particularly in the Tibetan tradition, there's a strong emphasis on um, medical help. Uh, it's not, um, it's seen as part of Dharma, understanding how the body mind works and, and cures. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we don't do some kind of uh, anti-medicine here, correct? Mm -hmm. So I'd like um, for Julie to present whatever she'd like to say, and I'd like people to um, uh, ask some uh, tough questions, have a discussion. You know, one of my supervisors um, in therapy, uh, Mary Lattimore um, would say, what's the basic question as a therapist you should be asking yourself, where is the healing happening right now? Where is the healing happening right now? The other thing that Dr. Lattimore uh, said, she said, <laughs> she would ask us, what's, what's a good client? I've told this story a million times, you know, you therapists in a room, we all answer, somebody who works really hard, Someone who, you know, is psychologically sophisticated, and we're all wrong. She said, "No, a good client is one that shows up and pays." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that. Okay, so are you ready? <laughs> you have your yeah. So I'm going to turn mine off. I don't know if we need both. Yeah. <laughs> 
Now at the same time, you'll do a sound check. I already dragged it against the table, so that was the sound check. It is, I wish to help, but will I be a help? There. Okay. Does that work? Yeah. yeah. Is it, should I angle it up a little bit? Yeah, I think that's better. Is that better? That's way better. Aha. Uh -huh. Wow. All of this technology. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is, um, Kind of an interesting segue into this uh, practice of medicine I just kind of created in the last year, and I'll get to the creation of it, but it bridges all of our wonderful technology and the modern medicine and modern tools that we have with my roots, um, and I I brought my grandfather's original doctor bag that he would bring to patients' homes probably through the early 90s. And um, he was a general surgeon, but at that time, really, uh, uh, he would go and take care of, of anyone that needed any kind of help and I, I grew up hearing my father's stories of uh, these wonderful, you know, being the son of this wonderful physician. And luckily I got to knew, know him uh, and he supported me through medical school and just is part of my practice. But um, I think potentially, I, I think talking about my journey, um, a little about my life journey and what led me to medicine and then what led me to this really gratifying new turn that I've taken in my career. So I started out as I, I was born like a creative, I wanted to do music, anything artistic. So I actually got my um, bachelor's uh, in music flute performance. Well, first year of college, um, I was waking up in the morning with terrible headaches. And long story short, I had a benign brain tumor. And it took a while to discover, but I had surgery. I put it off until summer, summer break, because I did not want to miss one single class. And um, I did this very intense brain surgery, came back in the fall, and I said to myself, gosh, I need to follow my family roots. Um, it's going to be really hard to hear the bassoons because my left side is completely deaf now. That was part of the surgery. They had to destroy my hearing completely, um, but they saved my facial nerve, and I am so grateful for that experience because it truly led me to medicine. Um, I was inspired. Actually, I thought I would do nursing because of um, the nurse educator that was part of the team. But then I just, one thing led to another and I decided to go to medical school, but I had three years left. I went to UC Santa Barbara to study with this incredible flute professor. I said, when else in my life am I going to be able to just study flute? And it was actually the best ticket into medical school because um, it turns out some medical schools really like different weird majors and people that can connect in other ways than biology or chemistry. And so I feel so fortunate uh, how my path just led me to becoming a physician because I truly love what I do. And um, I started out and uh, went to UC Davis, just right around the corner, and met my husband in, in college. And, um, and just we were following each other all over the country. And we ended up at UC Davis. And I, I landed on family medicine. It was a bit of a circuitous route, but that's another story. And... I realized that um, I love knowing kind of the vast knowledge that a family practitioner needs to know. It's like a little bit of everything, but then you can find niches of things that really excite you. And so 
you know, there are certain areas within family medicine that I love and I'm really good at other ones. I say, okay, we're, we're just sending you straight to the cardiologist. Um, I know what I don't know, but I also early on discovered I have a passion for urgent care because I like the acute, I like the very unpredictable, the many emergencies or actually letting someone know this is a major emergency, you need to go to the ER and kind of problem solving constantly and not knowing kind of which patients are going to come in on any particular day. So I, I started my career and completely just worked in a fully urgent care um, clinic, but I did really miss the, what we call continuity and having my own patients because in family medicine training, we do get to practice primary care and I have the most respect for primary care physicians and providers because um, I think they have the most challenging job and I always bow down to them um, and, and just consider them a vital part of the team and actually specialists in their own right because they manage chronic disease. And that's just not something I enjoy. I like the, the tomato accidents and all right, I'll be right over, hold pressure just like this and we'll get you all squared away and off to Thanksgiving dinner. Um, but I did really, really have this aching in my heart for having kind of my own patients that I got to know, like my grandpa. So there were several points in my training and in my early career where I didn't realize it at the time, but I was fighting the system it was like, okay, I'm in urgent care. Yes. But I want to see this patient come back. I want to be the one I listened to their lungs two days ago. And if they're not sure if they've now developed a pneumonia, I know exactly what I'm listening for, but the system didn't like that. Oh, Dr. Allen, you can't, you know, how patients request you and all of these things that were so frustrating. And it was just like, it, it became very difficult to do what I knew was the best thing for the patient in this larger system. And actually that's how I, I met Lama. Um, it was, it got to be very stressful and I, I met him at Middle Way Health and he brought me out of a really, really difficult um, time in my career and my mental health kind of turned it around. And um, then we just started doing our Dharma sessions and the rest is history um, there. And I, I feel again, blessed by this really trying experience leading me um, to now be having the gift of knowing the importance of working on my inner world and having that clean space, um, just simple meditation. It's like, you know, the, the clear waters, the lotus flower floating and you look and it's murky and then it's clear and I can see kind of the depths and see the higher intuition and it's changed how I practice medicine because, when there's that stillness and clarity, I can tap into my intuition. And I didn't know in my early days of being a doctor where like, I, I kind of had a hunch for a lot of things. I, I You can see a sick patient, they train you in this, but there was a lot of, there's a lot of, it is an art the art of medicine. Like, why do I just know these things? But of course I would double and triple check myself and stay up late and follow these patients that I'd sent to the ER and see what their primary care had done. And I, I did a lot of learning, but I was like, how did I know that? And so there is kind of an un, um, tapped intuition that is becoming for me now, since I've done a lot of the inner work, just more clear and uh it's really fun as well <laughs> so that that's a, a brief and i mean many directions we could go but yeah and and so i'll just say what i'm doing so i did leave the the system <laughs> i officially a year ago may said that is it 
I don't want anything to do with business, but I guess I'm going to have to uh, fight that, learn a little bit how to start my own. So I just, I started my own practice. I've been doing this a year now. And what I get is my own patients, people that can call me. I'm like a doctor in the pocket because I have members that, what, what do I do? Do I, do I need to go in for this? Oh no, I can come over and look in your child's ear or, um, uh, it's so gratifying because I know the families and I don't have a clinic. I don't have an office. There's a lot that can be done virtually video, like, like we're doing here, uh, phone call, texting me a picture, but then there are things that I will just run over. It's not usually this bag, but I have all of the supplies and I'll go to the patient's home and we'll, we'll figure it out. And, um, We'll do an in-person exam or a procedure. And so I'm little like a little urgent care plus anything patients need. So if someone doesn't is looking for a primary care doctor, I can be that person while they're finding them. It's like whatever the patient needs, now I have the time and I have I, I feel so blessed. Um it's an adventure. I am early on and uh it, it's we'll see where it goes, but I am, I'm really enjoying practicing this way. So what questions, any, I like difficult questions. I'll make a comment to start. Okay. So I can broaden questions. So I'm, I'm delighted that Julie's talking about um, how she's enjoying her career and has started her own business because um, an essential part of uh, healing and enlightenment and awakening is right livelihood. It's very interesting. The Buddha put that actually in in the path in the Astamarga in the Eightfold Path, right livelihood. So I'm very interested in the song of people sharing and talking about how they do their livelihood, how they support themselves, how they coordinate their family with retreat practice and morning meditation practice, how they support themselves. This is not something that we should keep outside uh, and be anonymous. No, we, we need to bring in and um, you know talk about how how we budget our world, how we create things. So um, several of us, um, I'm interested in, and I know Ellen Wolf is, and Bill Dizel, particularly uh, creating an environment to uh, to help people with their dharma business, so to speak, to to talk about right livelihood to. Uh, work with our support system. It's um, not something outside of uh, realization. It's it's core, because when we're in line with our vocation, um, it's incredible, isn't it? So I would say, you know, I'm just, um, I'm being very Asian here, monastery style, calling people out. You know, I'd say like, Autumn, it seems like you're, you're doing your right livelihood too, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Yeah. It makes all the difference, doesn't it? Yeah, it makes all the difference. I mean, everything goes together from the practice to the business to the family. It's like one seamless life. You know, there's no compartmentalization. It's just all together. Yeah. But we still need to work on marketing because we probably didn't, we, you know, didn't invite uh, Julie and Tom to Living Lion. Loving Lionheart, did we? Right here. Did we invite her to the movie? Yeah, see? The... <laughs> Maybe we could screen it here sometime. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hi. Thank you for coming today. So um, I, I have a son-in-law that's an ER doctor. And he's he's not very happy, you know. He's working too much, and I just want. I'm just so, makes me so curious because I see him so tired, and I just wonder, like, was there like, just like a day where you're just like, I can't go anymore, or, because I feel like he might be approaching that, which, you know, he all of his family are doctors. He's a lineage of doctors forever and ever, and that he he was going to do something different, but then, I don't know. But anyway, I just was curious for you, like, what I wanted you to talk to him, actually, because it's got to that point. So anyway. But. And 
the term people are using all the time is burnout. Um, and it's a scary thing because there are fewer and fewer healthcare providers and something really needs to change. I was able to do this um, with the support of my husband, but not everyone can. And um, it, it's really concerned when you see these early signs, um, it, there aren't great answers now because our broader medical system, I don't think is taking care of the providers at all. Um, they try, but it's, it's a huge challenge. And for me, I didn't reach that personally. It was more like, I, I am not able to reach my full potential to serve my patients because of all of these, like, well, you, you can only get 10 minutes for be it like strep throat, which usually that can be done in 10 minutes or a complex facial laceration and the documentation. And it's like that for probably most healthcare providers. And I would love to talk to him because I mean, not that I have answers, maybe he'll want to join my practice. <laughs> <laughs> probably oh well then yes probably yeah oh my gosh but there are it, it, if it gets to the it's like and, and there's the sad truth um statistic is there is one um physician suicide every day and it it's just kind of mind boggling to think about that, but I've known um, one of our dear med school classmates mm -hmm. who was just the last person you would ever think mm -hmm. and pediatric cardiology fellow at the time. So I, I think the balance is, just, it's very, it's such a difficult question, but I think early signs and being brave enough to make some kind of change. Yeah. But please put me in touch. I would, I would love to connect because I actually, in my, I loved my, where I worked this clinic for the first six, seven years of my career. My colleagues were just phenomenal. We all learned. I had a women's health specialty background and one of my colleagues was an ER, former ER doctor. And then I had the nurse practitioner colleagues. And then I had um, people that had done primary care for 20 years and found it. And we all collaborated and I learned so much good medicine there. So, yeah. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, very relevant. I just wanted to make a, a mention of something, and then I have a question for you. Um, there is a program called Sierra uh, Joy of Medicine that's out of Sierra Sacramento Valley Medical Society that offers up to six free sessions for any physician that's in the Sacramento area with a provider. I, I'm one of I'm on their panel, <laughs> so. Yeah, so that that's a good resource for really good. Uh, struggling physicians. Um, and uh, one of my early, I'll, I'll preface my question with something, uh, a story about Lama. Um, very early on when I came to the temple, um, somebody asked Lama, how do you bring the Dharma to everyday life? Do you remember what you said, Lama? <laughs> yeah, do you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, he said, the question you should be asking is, how do you bring everyday life to the Dharma? And so that, that really struck me. And ever since then, it's kind of struck me. And so I guess my question for you is, how um, has your practice informed your, your, your medical practice informed your Buddhist practice? Like, how are you bringing your medical practice to the Dharma? Mm, that's a really good question. And thank you for calling that, that uh, the society is wonderful and there are resources like that. So thank you so much. Um, I truly 
feel like my medical practice is a spiritual endeavor because I am, as healthcare providers, we're given a glimpse into someone's life that people often don't share with anybody else. And it's a true privilege. And so I, I, I the medicine Buddha, I, I was telling Lama, I, I had, he gave me this beautiful card and um, I'll put that up when I meditate. And it, it's just a, it, so symbolic of healing others, healing myself and having that unique perspective. It's like, I, it, it, what you were saying, you have to care for yourself and um, the larger practice. It's all connected. Like you were saying, it's just like a seamless journey and being a physician it's just such a privilege and so it's like I I feel that importance more because I do want to be this vessel that is fully on mind body spirit level able to care for my patients so it's a really nice interplay if that somewhat answers the question I have a question. Oh. oh, you found someone? Where are you going? You're running. You're very good. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Wow. Could you, could you yeah. speak to end of life slash hospice issues? End of life slash hospice issues. It's a big one. Uh, actually, I, I did a, a house call to a hospice patient just a couple months ago. And that's, again, a very spiritual time. And I was really, I was able to provide comfort for the patient, but also the family. And their palliative care nurses are just wonderful. Hospice nurses are absolute gems and what I did was instill confidence in the family like these nurses know more than I do about a lot of what's going on with your loved one and um yeah end of life and crossing over I, I again feel very privileged when I get to be a part of that because I I'm the type of physician that I, I sit down and I, I take the time and I'm there for what anyone needs. And that's so important at that time of life. Anything specific, other, other specific questions or? No, I will share a little story. When my father uh, passed away, he was a, a Christian minister mm -hmm. and uh, not that the, the uh, friend of mine came and read the offices to him. And uh, of course he was old and uh, uh, the priest came by and gave him last rites. And I brought the old hymnal and spent several hours just singing hymns. And it just seemed like the, and he died a couple of hours later. It just seemed like the holiest, most wonderful death that I could imagine. And it was such a privilege to be there. That's beautiful. I, I Another hospice um, privilege I had was playing my flute for a dear friend's mother uh, at that time, hours before. And I, I just, music is absolutely magical and so now i'm not a professional musician but i get to use those gifts in that type of way and talk about fulfillment i love that story uh, thank you for your talk. Um, since you have left the traditional institutional system, 
how do you feel about um, working with others who are not within that system? Um, people who try to establish wellness and vitality um, via, I don't know, all sorts of different kinds of, of methods, chiropractors, you know, do you refer, do you consult? I mean, how do you feel about that whole area of medicine? I'm so glad you brought that up because it's very much a part of me. And I, I love, it's again, a team approach because um, I've, I've worked recently with pranic healers and uh, again, when I assess a patient on a whole, I, I'm not just thinking about Western medicine. There are so many different complementary. You can't heal just by one modality. And I do refer, I, I don't have yet like specific people I refer to in all different, you know, acupuncture and chiropractic, all of these things quite yet, but I, I, I generally say, well, this would be really good. To, we can try this, but, um, acupuncture, pranic healing, all of these things might also help and be really, really vital. And so I'm, it's a team. I, I, I really don't hesitate to mention that to people. And I learn which patients might be more perceptive or how I would introduce that concept. No. Chronic. So it's energy healing. And it's a, a very interesting um, modality and working with chakras. And um, I, I just know little about it, but it's fascinating. If you want to look it up, it's it's really interesting. And it can be done virtually. So, oh. uh, yeah, you have the mic, my dear. Oh, okay. Hi, I can't see you. There you are. Hello. I, um, when I was a child through middle school, I lived in an area where physicians would come to your house. So, um, the other day. I dug out a bunch of pictures from my mother and there was our doctor at the dining room table at my grandmother's house. So that was an interesting thing to think about. Uh, all my life I've covered the business of healthcare. And at that time, business was conducted via one fee and now it's conducted in a whole other way. So I'm just curious, how do you deal with insurance? Sadly, yeah, I right now, our insurance companies do not like what I'm doing, spending all this time with people. So at the moment, I have had to not even deal. So I'm only um, outside of insurance, but I, I love... I'm supposed to say you have to ask your employer, but virtually all HSA plans should be I work. Um, but unfortunately, that is the sad reality is that I can't accept insurance. I had to opt out of Medicare and all of these legal things I had to learn. And it was really frustrating because it wouldn't be possible to do what I'm doing and deal with insurance. But are, I, I are you, hope for are the you future. conducting a, a concierge type style? It's kind of like concierge. The other very close model is called direct primary care. And the idea is the direct part where you there, I don't have a secretary, I don't have someone to schedule. It's literally just me. And that's the beauty is you call and you immediately get a physician on the phone, it's very high access. So it's beyond what any insurance would at this time ever pay for. So it's, I feel like I am truly someone's family member that is a doctor. And uh, the difference 
is I don't practice primary care specifically. So I've really created my own model, but concierge, I think a lot of them do bill insurance. Um, there are all these little nuances and it's kind of hard to explain because I did create this model myself with the urgent care and anything else. <laughs> it's like what I enjoy practicing, that's what I offer. Uh, and and I, I, I love, I just had to comment on that visual of the family doctor. That's what I do. I, yesterday, I, I made three house calls it was, it's like, sometimes I'll have no patience and then I'll have a really busy day. And the dog is there like this giant dog. And I'm like working to get to the kid. And I love that. I just, <laughs> um, but right. So it's, I think the difference too, is that I am keeping my patients like a smaller group of patients. So I can literally be very, very high touch and a lot of other practices, direct primary care, even, and concierge have still a lot of patients. So you're not going to get as immediate of a response. There is, um, thank you very, very much. As a retired RN, I can relate to everything you're saying. Um, there is a Puranic, I'm probably not pronouncing mm -hmm. it, um, once a month on a Saturday, they have a two-hour free session, and it's in Rancho Cordova. So you oh. could probably find it online, and it's all energy. Wonderful. Yeah, prana is an energy, so um, that is really good to know. I've uh, connected with people all over the country, and so that's a lot closer. <laughs> I love it. Hello. Hi, I'm Dora Lee, and it's wonderful to hear you talk. I was a clinical psychologist in an integrative medicine center for six wonderful. years, and it was an incredible experience because all the different modalities were in one place, yes. and we all consulted as a team for how to work with people holistically, just like you're talking mm -hmm. about, but part of what was significant for me was that um, many people, by the time they came to the Integrative Medicine Center, they had gone through many other traditional medical routes and didn't get help. And so, you know, it meant that their, their, their illnesses had progressed much more than they probably would have if they had come earlier. And it's just this deep message of self-care, really, yes. to pay attention inwardly to like you were talking about to all the dimensions of our lives that impact our physical health and to say you know I deserve you know to take care of myself in that way and reach out in the ways you're talking about and and all the other alternative modalities too so thank you oh thank you integrative medicine is absolutely wonderful if all practices could be like integrative medicine we would be in a different place and um, thank you. Yeah, psychology is so important to it. All uh, we all have such unique skills, and and I, I love bringing it, bringing it all together. Hi, um, Hi. I'm sure your grandfather would be very happy to to hear your direction. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, you touched on uh, the idea of this uh, intuitive connection you have with your patients. Could you tell us a little more about that? So I. Like I said in the beginning, it's like, how do I know, just have this knowing? It's a knowing, but I was a first child, type A, like if I did not get an A plus, I was beating myself up and it's taken kind of 40 years to realize that's really not healthy. And so, um, so I questioned it all the time and I would back it up with the science and check myself 3000 times. Well. Now that I, COVID actually stopped me in my tracks, I was on the front lines in urgent care and I did that. And then there was a moment where I had to stop. They weren't protecting me actually at work um, with a, the right kind of mask. And 
these things, okay, I'm stopping and I'm working on my mindset. I'm working on my spiritual practice and, oh my gosh, am I going to forget medicine? And like, no, <laughs> you know, it came right back. But now, oh, those gut feelings, that was intuition. And I think there is a lot of un untapped knowledge that we can't describe in our current reality um, but is there and we need to listen. So what I do is now I, I really listen to that and I trust. And then it's nice because now I've got, you know, almost 15 years of experience with in practicing since I've graduated, but I have that to back me up more immediately than looking things up all the time. So I always you know, I'm going to do the test, but sometimes there's, there's not a test and which direction do you go? And it's so helpful because there sometimes is really no right answer. Like in many areas, I'm sure everyone can relate to that in whatever profession and, but using that, to, okay, we're going in this direction and Hey, if it's wrong, that's okay. I'm going to listen to the patient and we're, it's very open communication. Does that kind of touch on? I'm really interested in that, uh, in that area. I think um, instinct, intuition, synchronicity, all of these things are, yes. are somehow unexplained by modern science, yeah. but understood in uh, Buddhism, especially. Right. And so it's quite interesting to me how you're tapping into that. Oh, I love it. I would love to talk more about that. Yeah, it's the more and more kind of connected and grounded I am, it's not just helpful, you know, as a physician, but it's just how to walk through life and notice the beauty that was, yeah, I would zoom through before. So I, I love all of these things are connected. Yeah, let's let's definitely talk more about that. Thank you for your talk. Um, so I'm sure breaking away from a modern day conventional medical system and forming your own unique practice, um, was challenging. And I'm sure there were a lot of difficulties, doubts, fears. Can you talk about how you face them and how you used your practice in terms of that? Oh, these questions are fabulous. <laughs> so... I now know that fear is an indication that I'm going in the right, right direction. Because if there's not fear around something, oh, that's just doing the same thing. That's comfortable. Fear is this really interesting signal that we get from our, like if we listen to our body, that will tell us we're in a state of fear or anxiety. So there were many times like, oh gosh, I have to buy my own malpractice plan. Like, oh, you know, oh, well, what is this feeling? So tapping in, okay, that's just anxiety. Like, how are you going to pay the bills? And is this going to be the right plan? But it's, a, it's something necessary because I am getting closer and closer to my dream and closer and closer to serving patients the way they deserve to be. So at every point where I was faced with, oh my gosh, now I'm not going to have my partners to realize, like, oh, I can still call them and people call me. And it's like, hold on, because our bodies do this to us. And so another thing is just neuroregulation. Like I have, that's, <laughs> my breathing alarm went off during, and I'm like, oh my goodness. I told Loma I had my phone on silent and then my breathing alarm. So I have a couple breathing alarms go off through the day and it's just a stop, like three really full intentional breaths to regulate the nervous system. So I can think clearer and be present for my kids who, uh, that's another huge part of my life. And um, they probably love and hate what I'm doing all at the same time. And so I need a lot more patience. I'm still working on that and trying to be a wonderful example for them, but it's a process. Hmm. Uh, oh, lots of questions for Doctor. Hi, I'm 
biased because I'm married to Julie. <laughs> and and I'm also a physician. So um, I really love the talk and the conversation it generated here. I had, um, gosh, just a, a few comments and then maybe a question for Lama. <laughs> um, the four immeasurables uh, prayer that was up, I just love that. I'm glad our children are here for that and I'll yeah. repeat that for them yeah. uh, later. Um, I think what Julie's doing is is um, just providing a, a service that's, I think it, it, it just demonstrates actually the type of medical care that patients want. I'm in the system, I'm part of, you know, the stand, traditional medicine and I, and I see patients coming in and they're just, they're on, you know, I can give a diagnosis and give a treatment, but then they, they leave unhappy and they leave just their longing for something more that I think a, a lot of American corporations and the culture of medicine is just, it's challenging to provide that. So I, I love hearing Julie's story over and over again. Um, like the joy in meeting in medicine, which you're talking about, what, what the gentleman uh, brought up earlier today, uh, was, I think so important. This, this, there is so many physicians go into medicine for the joy and meaning and connecting and and he, providing a healing service. Um, my question for you, Lama, is. How, what advice would you give the struggling ER physician that we heard about that just comes home tired and stressed and is just looking for that joy and meaning in medicine? And, and you know, it, it's not practical for all of the American physicians to leave and, and start a practice like Julie's. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's I don't know. Maybe that's the answer. But what what would you what how how do you think we can unite? We can bring the Dharma practice. We can bring our livelihood to the Dharma practice, and bring that joy and meaning in that ten minute visit. Probably, I would um, uh, say something kind of radical. Um, like, please only give 10% of your energy um, because the American system always says give 100%. And um, I don't think it's just a profession, but that's a mistake because give 100%, you're dead. So we're still, even in a very stressful job like ER, we're still um, responsible to retain most of the energy for ourselves. So... I think it, it is the situation for sure. Some uh, times, you know, like he might have to um, leave ER and do something else, right? So uh, probably just metaphysically, psychologically, he's giving too much energy. And and that's hard for people. I mean, how, what's, what percentage of uh, blood can we give um, generally at, at the blood bank, right? 10, 15% max, right? So um, that's how much energy we should be putting out in general. Like right now, um, you guys are getting 10% of my energy. Yeah, see, you find that shocking because you go, well, wait a minute, we're, we're only getting 10%. <laughs> what am I doing here? You know, um, but People heard me, you know, if I said like, um, uh, okay, um, could you give me 10% of your salary? Could you tithe? They go, oh my God, that's a lot. So the, what we're doing in Dharma is actually we're, we're increasing our um, capacity, our holding capacity. Because if you just have a little bowl, 10% um, is not going to be very much. So our job from... Uh, in the healing professions particularly, but in general as bodhisattvas is um, 
to stay to 10%, but 10% of a lake is bigger than 10% of a bathtub. Um, I have a, I used to have a little rock. I think it disappeared saying never give more than 49%. But really, you should only be giving 10 or 15% max because you, you won't be able to recover. And I'm very, as people know, I'm very interested in um, maintaining my energy state. And I don't sleep very much because I, I don't push it too much. I'm only giving you guys 10% right now, but uh, hopefully the 10% is is a lot because the, the inner world is big. I'm, I'm, I, when I used to do a lot of workers' comp counseling and still do, honestly, sometimes you do have to tell people to change their, to change it. And they're, they're too scared to change. Uh, and I think that's one of the biggest problems with um, when you get a, up to a certain level in healthcare. It's very difficult telling a nurse that's been nursing for a career for 36 years to just quit because by then you're making the real, you know, you think, well, finally I'm making the money I should have been making 35, 40 years ago. All right. So that it's, it, it's something that we have to discuss from a right livelihood point of view too. You know, can you, um, can you make, uh, can you make it on, on less? But um, it's really, it's really hard telling, um, it, it's really hard telling people in the health professions um, to, uh, particularly nurses, <laughs> to, to, to take care of themselves, right? Why why do you think that is? I'd I'd like to hear from both Tom and Julie. Why why is it so hard? Um, by the way, it's very hard to tell therapists to go to therapy too. <laughs> well, why is it so difficult? What do you guys think? I don't I don't I I just think if I talk to Patty's son in law, it it would be very difficult to get through. Mm. I would do it, but. Why? Why would it be so difficult? It's not a skill. Like if you do a lot more, you'll get it a lot more. Like I feel like that when oh sorry, I feel like that when I care for my mom, I can't stop myself. But then I feel the burnout, and then I want to give some more. But then I'm not being fair to myself. So there's this constant battle. Yeah. So she was saying in the beginning that there would be the guilt is such a burden. Can you ask your question one more time, Lama? I, I couldn't quite understand it. So why is it difficult to talk to the... Why is it difficult the, to tell people like us and nurses who are in these giving professions the importance of taking care? Yeah, you're, you know, people that are like, it could be hospice workers too. You're in direct contact with people suffering. So I think it's know. a mindset that... Um, as I, I don't know if it's just present in America, but it's a mindset that uh, of prioritization. And I, so in in my opinion, I think the reason it's difficult to connect and and to have a conversation like that is is the mindset is is it's just a little backwards sometimes. And, and I, it's hard for me to say what what pinpoints exactly is the mindset problem, but I think just some of the facts demonstrate it. And like like the fact that like the lowest paid physicians are are pediatricians. That should be our society and our mindset should should be reversed those should be the high the, those are the people taking care of the children who are going to become adults <laughs> we need to have our mindset be like like the pediatricians should be the highest paid and the urologists and the plastic surgeons should, should be <laughs> lower paid. and so i think if the overall mindset changed so that we're continuously kind of thinking about things more just differently that 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 conversation will be easier to have. 
And I think in our training, it's drilled in and residency, you go in and it's like, I mean, we were still in the era of 80 hours and it turned into a hundred hours and it, you're not sleeping. You're getting paged in the middle of the night when it's your night to sleep and you're off and like you do everything like that. You, if that's why it's called residency. Cause the, like when my, my grandfather's, um, so my dad's two brothers are physician. They lived in the hospital. They were residents. <laughs> and it's like, that is your only priority. Like, good luck if you get a, a five minutes to eat here and there. And so that's just so inherent in our training. It's like, that's, mm -hmm. yeah. And I think, and you had a comment too, right? Someone over here too? I'll zip over there. Okay. Hi. Um, sorry, I've just been thinking about um, my response. <laughs> um, so I guess how I see it is that we live in a, I mean, United States, I think is generally more of a Christian based culture. And I think of Jesus as being a person that gave 200%. Um, and so I think there's somehow in our mindset, that's our drive and how our culture was created here in our society. But I've spent time in Buddhist cultures and countries where I learned at a young age that it's a very different, it's so internal. And in that kind of way you're talking about how, you know, that inner um, development, let's just say, um, is so important. <laughs> And I don't think as a culture, we have really valued that. We don't even understand that, <laughs> that that's important. Um, I mean, people here probably, <laughs> but I think probably most of, of America like, or Western culture does not. Um, and so I guess I just think that like, for us, it's like an identity, you know, our, our jobs are our identity because that's, you know, how do I, how do we identify in the world? And um, it's by our jobs. It's not by who we are as a fuller human connected to life. It's about, you know, so to, to say to somebody like, you know, only give 10%, they're just kind of like give, my 90% of my identity away or, you know, like, I think that's kind of how I, I come to it. It's like, oh, but it also takes, it's also like, now we're like so much more responsible for that 90%, you know, like of growing and connecting and being <laughs> more, um, I don't know, have more inner knowledge or something, um, Sorry, I don't know if that all makes sense, but that's just <laughs> my, uh, yeah, comment. <laughs> thanks. Yes, thanks. And then the, the comment over here you saw, Andrew? Sorry for double dipping here. Um, I want to give a quick answer, if I can, to Lama's question, and from my perspective. I think that um, medicine... Um, Physicians have so much responsibility, um, so many patients to see on a daily basis, um, so much suffering that um, it's it can be overwhelming. And so I think physicians tend to shut down uh, as a coping strategy um, and not look at, not really be present if they can help it with the suffering in a lot of cases, which also includes, I think, shutting down the presence with their own suffering. And that's part of where burnout leads comes from, I think, is um, it's a coping strategy gone awry, is how I see it. Um, so, but I also wanted to just say, I'm loving this robust conversation. Uh, I think you're right, Lama, we have a fair number of healing professionals as a part of this Sangha. And um, I was just thinking, um, it is kind of a unique perspective to be face to face with so much suffering and doing things like what you're doing, which is I'm doing something very similar, trying to uh, move out of the medical system into my own way of helping. And um, 
So I was just thinking maybe if it's okay with you, Lemma, I'm I'm open to inviting people to have a conversation outside of here. Um, those of us in the healing professions who were in the healing professions that um, there's a lot of knowledge in this room. There's business people here. Um, there's a lot of knowledge. If, if, if so people wanted to have another conversation and see where it goes, this is kind of how Dharma dudes started is a robust mm -hmm. conversation in, in a, um, in a, in a Sunday service. And so I'd love to, you know, come see me after this, if you'd like to maybe get together somewhere for brunch and just talk over things, uh, our, our mutual interests. Well, we are going to break for potluck lunch in about two minutes here. So um, maybe, um, are, are you still able to stay for lunch? Yeah, definitely. Um, by the way, um, your, your boys in the back there have been really super nice. Yeah. Hey, you guys. Um, <laughs> My my prescription actually for burnout is um uh I'm, this is my anecdotal <laughs> not research um when when people have uh, children in the house they're less likely to get burned out actually it's when people are are alone um, that they're you know they're alone in the healing professions um, I think that's the most you know I could even say dangerous. Mm -hmm. So even though it's very difficult, um, you know, having small kids and and both parents working, and I think particularly in, you know, um, working directly with the suffering, my uh, my guess after uh, being some kind of therapist for um, the last kind of forty years is that uh, family family life is chaotic, but it's the most healing. And it's when people are alone and don't have friends or don't have sangha that the real burnout kicks in, you know. So that's uh, why it's nice to get together like this, you know, and share because um, that probably um, isn't some research that um, the people stay the healthiest are the ones that have friends, isn't that so? Yeah, there's mm -hmm. strong research. Yeah. 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 And actually, yeah. just a quick comment, that's probably like the, where I get the greatest um, mm -hmm. joy in this current practice that I've developed is being there with someone to navigate our crazy, you know, challenged system. And so I that's like, maybe the most fun is like, oh, my gosh, where do I go? What questions do I ask my doctor? Um, can you come to the ER with me? Oh, yes, I do all those things. Or being there for people combats, you know, feeling alone, and it is very, very dangerous. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Like all of the insights in here have been really, really great. So appreciate this let's, opportunity let's so much. Again. So um uh, it takes it takes a few minutes to uh, bring the potluck out, um, so uh, people know what to do. And we need to close with uh, dedication. Correct? Yeah, fine. Let's begin. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chen Rezin Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unparaffing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, 
Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losandragpa, I make request at your holy feet. We do have announcements. I'm going to pass the mic to you. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Julie. I got it. Um, actually, uh, we had this, um, I have to look at one. It's from Dr. Julie. It's a, a flyer that Dr. Julie brought with, with her that talks about her practice and how you can get in touch with her if you would like to have somebody so wonderful like her to help you. And so we'll have those available. And... Um, um, oh, and also a card too, uh, so you can put it in your wallet. And um, so anyway, and then beyond that, um, uh, for as far as announcements go, we have a, 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 me a meeting, a membership meeting today at three o'clock. Um, and um, Jen is leading it, and there's like four other people, but it's for everybody. Everybody can come, and uh, Jen even got a big tablet to take notes on of all your ideas. And um, <laughs> Yeah, and uh, anyway, thank you all for coming. And um, oh, and just coming up, I always like to mention this because it's such a, a special thing, is Geshe Sewang from Ladakh, India, is coming to do a mandala tour, and he's going to do a sand mandala here. And um, that'll be uh, uh, October 15th to October 20th, and everybody's invited. And please spread the word. It's very special. We should, uh, let's have him do Medicine Buddha. And uh, yeah, of course, that's, that's what we're all about here, about healing. And uh, Dr. Julie's definitely uh, embodies that. So thank you. And. So music. Yeah. Let's, see. let's see what you come up with. <laughs> Oh, man. 